music engraving, in its original form, finds its roots in the beginning of the 15th century Europe. Previously, we saw that, during this period, sheet music printing mainly relies on two main techniques, the use of woodblocks and the usage of removable characters. But at the end of the century, occasionally, like it is the case for graphic representations like maps or various artistic works in general, copper plates are used for music, plates on which reversed sheet music are engraved by hand, before being inked to print many copies of an original sheet music. This technique obviously has its advantages, the plates can be stocked easily in a small space to be reused at any time, however, it requires to have a very skilled engraver, who also perfectly knows music. The engraver of the 15th century must be able to read a manuscript and to reproduce it in reverse without any error, as correction are difficult to do, if not impossible in most of the cases, and the situation will not change until several centuries. Both the ability of the hand and the eye are thus required and very important. The engraving of music on metal plates seems to have been practiced in England before it was used in Italy, or any other country. It begins during the reign of King James I. The Idiaresis Negation RSD music engravers, in England, are William and Robert Hull. William engraves Parthenia, a collection of pieces dedicated to the king's daughter and written by three famous composers, William Byrd, John Bull, and Orlando Gibbons. The work is published in 1611. Robert Hull engraved a volume that is quite similar. We may also notice the presence of Nicholas Lanier, an eminent musician and engraver, in the service of James I. Lanier is the king's master of music between 1625 and 1666. The technique of engraving becomes popular during the 18th century, but slowly, let us examine the situation in London, for instance, at the beginning of the century, there is only one engraver of music there, named Thomas Cross. The great labor of engraving music, the cost of the plates, and other incidental expenses, still make music printing with removable fonts preferable to the pocket of the publishers, although the result of printing is inferior in appearance and elegance. However, during this period, Dutch printers discover a means of softening copper so as to make it susceptible of an impression for the stroke of a hammer or a punch, the point whereof has the form of a musical note. There are many works produced by this process, and, between 1700 and 1725, these Dutch printers have de facto the monopoly of the method. However, the difficulty of getting music from abroad in England and the high duty on the importation of this music, are motives to reproduce the technique of the Dutch printers in England. The attempt includes the use of a pewter for copper, as the former material is more workable with punches than the latter. The enterprising publishers who carry this plan to a successful end are John Walsh and John Hare. John Walsh is active in London since 1695 and, in fact, he becomes successful at the financial level because he begins to use pewter instead of copper to make the engraving work. He attracts talented and renowned composers like Handel, which commissions him to publish his opera entitled Rinaldo. The method of engraving fixed by Walsh and Hare is used with scarcely any improvement until the 19th century, in England. Meanwhile, in Germany, punches with more elegant shapes are made and publishers find ways to reduce their costs. For this reason, Many music books engraved and published in Germany are imported in England. However, besides the printing materials, it seems that the personal ability of the printers must also be taken into account, to make a judgment related to their work. It was said that, with the same punches, John Hare's son, who succeeded him, produced better results than his father. James Johnson, a prolific music engraver from Edinburgh, is active during the last quarter of the 18th century and the first decade of the 19th century. He engraves numerous sheet music plates, including those of the 600 English folk songs reunited by himself and his friend, the poet Robert Burns, in an anthology named Scott's Musical Museum. That anthology is published in 1797 and is made of six volumes. This is an important work because a part of its materials influences composers like Haydn and Beethoven. The first volume notably contains compositions written by Purcell. Let us notice that, during this period, at least in Scotland, 
the question of copyright is not really taken into account. The mixture of songs coming from England and Scotland increases, leading to the creation of new songs which do not belong anymore to a specific composer. Previous collectors at songs that were popular in their day, without care as to the source whence they are derived each publisher seeking only to render his own publication more attractive than those of his predecessors. The songs of English musicians are thus included, but their names are systematically suppressed, even for living authors. And although the authorship of these songs may have been known to many at the time of publication, it soon passes out of memory. That said, copyright issues are becoming more and more important over time, in connection with the spread of engraved music plates used as the main print medium. In the 19th century, in Europe as in the United States, music publishers become increasingly aware of the advantages of engraving, in a sheet music industry which, at the beginning of the 20th century, is already global. The international competition is fierce and, to see its main issues, we may examine a specific case, the revision of copyright laws made in 1908 in the United States. Texts of audiences are still available online, which, for instance, let us know about the situation of a certain Henry Fraunhofer, then secretary of the Music Engravers Union. He sits before representatives of the Senate as the spokesperson of the Music Engravers Union, in order to try and induce the Senate to make a slight change in legislative proposals known as the Courier Bill and the Kittredge Bill. The secretary begins to say that, in order to protect the music engraving industry of the United States, it is absolutely necessary for these changes to be made. The reason why Mr. Fraunhofer proposes this is that some music publishers are, to use his expression, having a good deal of their engraving done in Europe, and by so doing they have reduced the work of American engravers to three days a week for about six months a year. Mr. Fraunhofer says that American engravers cannot compete with the engraving made in Europe, because their cost is about 50% cheaper, despite shipping fees because the plates engraved in Europe come through the custom house without a bit of duty on them, as they are stamped no value. During the hearing, Mr. Fraunhofer shows samples of classical music books that have been engraved outside the United States, while they have been printed and copyrighted in the United States. He adds that he saw a box with over 200 plates on which these sheet music were engraved. He supposes that it has gone on ever so long, but that the Music Engravers Union noticed it only lately. He adds that the situation has got very bad, as it concerns around 500 persons. A member of the Music Publishers Association, Mr. Nathan Burke, who, of course, represents the interests of the faction attacked by Mr. Fraunhofer, says that Mr. Fraunhofer's statement is not correct and that there is not an American music publisher who is sending manuscripts of composition written in America to engrave it on plates abroad. At the contrary, there are American publishers representing foreign houses who sell in the United States music that is published and printed in Europe, because the demand is not sufficiently great to warrant the expenditure of money in engraving plates and printing American editions. That is a question that interests principally foreign publishers. Mr. Burton takes the example of foreign operas. During this period, in the United States, there is very little demand for it. So a foreign publisher cannot sell more than a dozen of sheet music for a specific opera. Therefore, he will not pay to have special plates engraved in the United States for the purpose of selling a dozen of sheet music. And Mr. Burton adds that several members of the Music Publishers Association are concerned by such cases, in which the composer is entitled to a copyright in the United States. What about the law itself? All the concerned bills propose to give the American engravers the monopoly of setting type. They also propose to give to the American engraver the monopoly of making stereotyped plates from that type. Two of the bills take one step in addition and propose to give the American engraver the monopoly of lithography. Two of them go one step further and propose to give them photo engraving. It is not our purpose here to examine copyright laws in detail, but we see that, in 1908, the situation is quite complicated, in the United States, both for individual music engravers and for publishing companies. But Americans are not the only ones to complain. Apparently, during the same year, music publishers, in Germany, say that, since 1903, their engravers have less and less work too. This is explained by a specific American publisher, Mr. Benjamin Frank Wood, 
During that audience before the American Senate, Mr. Wood adds that he can show everyone the prices that publishers are getting in Germany and even that they can be higher than those fixed in the United States. More generally, Mr. Wood says that, if the American legislation become too protectionist, European countries will react in consequence and will avoid to buy sheet music printed in the United States. Besides financial questions, there are cultural ones. This specific debate around copyright laws in the United States shows the complexity of the sheet music market from the beginning of the 20th century, all around the world, and how being provided with a good offer by qualified and well-equipped music engravers can, during this period, make the difference for music publishers who pretend to position themselves within the global market. We read in the 1908 legislative proposals that some lawyers wanted to give American engravers the monopoly of lithography and photo engraving. In the next video of this cycle, we will examine what is lithography and how the technique was used by music publishers. See you soon on this channel. Meanwhile, as you are a sheet music industry professional, we would like to draw your attention to the existence of the Y Music search engine, which analyzes music using musical criteria based on the content of almost 40,000 pieces of music listed in the Y Music database. Today, music listeners listen to more music in a single year than their 17th century ancestors during their entire existence. However, Online music services ask their users to have a specific query in mind when entering keywords, such as a title. Due to these language limitations, there is a gap between listeners' expectations and what they receive, in terms of musical content. It is not enough to type the word inspiring to receive as the first search result a piece of music that will automatically inspire us. This is even more obvious in a general search engine. If a user writes, in the search box, what are musical pieces similar to the Rite of Spring by Stravinsky, the results include links to different interpretations of the title, pages devoted to Stravinsky's life or to his work. However, no title similar to the Rite of Spring at the musical level is mentioned directly in the results and no link to listen to this similar music is provided. Everything must still be done. Idem for your favorite music. This means that listeners do not receive an answer to their original question. Neither general search engines, nor streaming services are programmed either to analyze the musical content of a title and provide the results to the user, or to establish direct musical relationships between different pieces of music. This is not their function, but it is the project of the Y Music team. We are passionate about our mission, which is to create a technological innovation in the field of music which aims to help all music listeners to understand it in more depth. Developed by a computer engineer recognized for his expertise in the music software industry, Y Music is more than an algorithm that searches for chords or melodies. It is the first musical search engine in the full sense of the term. Together, let us reinforce the achievements of technological evolution in the field of sheet music and allow it, allow us, to go further in our research. We invite you to test Y Music on our website.